Irish men and Irish women against the proclamation of the Republic. It addresses all citizens as equal, men and women. It doesn't subdivide into citizens with a university education and those without, into citizens with part-time jobs as councillors and those without, into important citizens singled out for preferential treatment with special voting rights, and citizens who matter less and are pushed to the sidelines. But that's exactly what the Shanna does. The second chamber is a parody of democracy because it perverts the principle of one citizen, one vote. We're not all equal at the ballot box. And this is an injustice which undermines our nation for women, for men, for all of us. Only 3% of the population, as Regina said, is eligible to vote. That equates to about one person here. The rest of you have been deselected. How do you feel about that? Yet we're invited to regard the Shannon as a key component in the machinery of government. It's as vital as an e-voting machine. This body is supernumerary, superfluous, and surface to requirements. Our founding mothers and fathers believed every Irish person was as good as the next one, and I do too. I don't accept the graduates of a particular institution should have an extra vote compared with those who left school at 16. I don't accept that city and county councillors should have half a dozen votes more than their neighbours. It would be a national outcry if a law were introduced that only people earning 100,000 and above a year could vote. Or only people born in Dublin 4. Or only people with the Rolls Royce in their garage. Yet for decades, the outlandish notion has been tolerated that a select caste can pull rank at the polls. The Shannon is an elite voted for by an elite to function as an elite. Enough. High time we abolish this discriminatory institution which is gratuitous, irrelevant and indefensible. This discriminatory institution which lacks a general democratic mandate. This discriminatory institution which exists to serve the needs of senators, not the needs of the people. <coughs> During the debate, we've been hearing a lot about Shannon reform. Or <coughs> then, how the Shannon has never bothered to introduce any family-friendly reforms, which, is it had the, which, is, which it has had the power to do, and which would have made it more viable for female senators. There's nothing to stop it setting its own rules for how and when it would sit, changing its hours to function from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., say. It could have shown the Doyle a more progressive way of doing business. Instead, it simply mimics the Doyle with late sittings. Those dark nighttime hours are among the impediments to women's participation in politics. Do the senators care? Judge them by their actions to date. Too little, too late. They don't care. They pay lip service to lipstick senators. Senators are operating in an, in an arcane gentleman's club, established in a distant era and never updated. They never even tried to modernize. Why? Because it's disconnected from the electorate from women and from men, cocooned in a privileged world of Joel Joel. Yet this is the body we're meant to believe safeguards our democracy. Reformists suggest abolition is a power grab by the government. 
How can you seize power from a toothless tiger? Keeping the Shannad actually helps the executive because it dissipates power. A stronger Doyle is a better guarantor for democracy. Reformists suggest the Shannad could and will do more to earn its keep. They're building opera houses in the sky. This talk of reform gives people the idea some better model of governance is on the cards with the Shannon at the centre of it. But what we've been saddled with can only be tinkered with. It can't be remodelled. It's an elitist chamber which has failed, and no wonder, because it has no place in a modern democracy. The idea that the Shannon can somehow hold the door to account is nonsense. One minister, the Taoiseach, appoints almost a fifth of its members, ensuring the Shannon will always act as a rubber stamp on Doyle decisions, as Regina pointed out. Look, it might affect a few tweaks and bills, but I wouldn't overstate what it does there, although its members have no such compunction. The issue isn't whether the Shannon occasionally influences legislation, but whether we want an undemocratic body some of them elected by no one at all, influencing public policy. Catherine mentioned the whipped doll. The Shannon is just as party whipped as the Doyle, and a significant number of the independents who are not party whipped don't even bother turning up to vote, as we learned this week. Absenteeism is rife. An average of one in four senators misses every vote, and the performance of independence is particularly poor. When questioned about their truancy, they said they voted on matters where they felt they had a contribution to make. But in two recent crucial bills, personal insolvency and social welfare, fewer than half of all senators turned up. Now, contrast this with a vote on the future of the Shannon. All but one managed to get themselves along to that. A self-interested little crew are our guardians of democracy. So, they accept payment for a job they don't do. Incidentally, the 12 independents each receive 23,000 euro a year leaders allowance. Yet some of them, trying to justify their no-show track record, are saying they only vote on subjects they know something about. What's that additional money for but to pay for research and backup so they can speak and vote on other issues of national interest? The hypocrisy, the greed, the contempt for the people of this country is shameful. No wonder some sections of the public view the upper house as junket grand central. Perhaps, Senator, that's what people are angry about. No fantasia of a Shannon is waiting in the wings to replace this failure of a Shannon, as presented by Senator Zappone. The referendum is a choice between an equal, democratic doy and an unequal, undemocratic Shannon. Retaining a reformed chamber is not on the ballot paper, and it's not there for good reason. Reform either means chancing a few repairs on a redundant system, or it means a second door and log jamming our politics for <coughs> decades to come. None of the reform proposals floated in the past gained traction because none of them can resolve the fundamental problem the Shannon is beyond reform. Reform is an appealing word, though, an alluring concept. In the context of the Shannon, it's a fool's paradise. Shannon advocates keep telling us how crucial it is to the way Ireland functions. It strikes me the Shannon is rather more crucial to the well-being of 60 well-paid part-time senators than it is to the people. Even the reforms put forward by the Queen's Home Bill 
where they envisage doing away with severance pay for future senators, insists it should be kept for incumbent senators. Once again, in Irish life, it's a quoi moi le déluge, the latter drawn up behind vested interests. The Queen's opponent master plan also retains the university seats, retains elitism. Voices calling for retention include those with something to gain, existing senators. After all, it's lucrative and untaxing work with kudos attached to membership. But the Shannon is a 60-person democracy deficit. Remember the cronyism, the political party friends and backup backroom boys rewarded with senatorships. Remember the TDs who lost their seats and were housed in the second chamber until they could run again or reached retirement age. Remember the lavish parachute payments they receive when they leave the Shannon. <coughs> it's intrinsically undemocratic to give public office to those rejected by the electorate. Yet more than a third of senators in the current Shannon were unsuccessful Doyle candidates in 2011. Clearly, it's a training ground for the Doyle or a resting place until another tilt is taken at it. Should we preserve an institution which dishonours the notion of democracy and equality because the old talented individual may sit in it? Mary Robinson's name was invoked. <coughs> Citizens with something to contribute will advance to the forefront by another route. Meanwhile, Ireland is equipped with more apparatus of government than is necessary or advisable given our bankrupt state. We ought to be moving faster towards a pared down, more efficient system of administration, one which doesn't rise to the public purse. The Shannon has been debased to the level of a huckster's sweet shop, where political favours are doled out like smarties, our taxes exploited, our tax burden increased. Yet even if the cost was neutral, as opposed to carrying a 20 million euro a year price tag for three days a week of hot air, and I see you right in there and I know you're going to dispute that figure, but it's generally accepted. <laughs> <laughs> even if it were cost neutral, the Shamrad must go. Even if it wasn't a feather bed for people with political connections, the Shannon must go. Even if senators hadn't shown themselves in their true colours with a recent venal cash snatch, trying to claim 300,000 a year for unnecessary constituency offices, <coughs> the Shannon must go. Even if it wasn't stuffed with weekend senators, the Shannon must go. Are you familiar with weekend senators? They're often political party apparatchiks, transformed into temporary senators as a cynical exercise. It's the gift that keeps giving. It affords them special opportunities to lobby ministers, thanks to lifelong access to the Doyle's private bar and members of the cabinet drink. Even if it wasn't a rotten borough at the heart of the political system, the Shannon must go. It must go because it offends against the core tenet of universal suffrage. Next week, for the first time in its history, every citizen has a vote on the Shannon's future. Now, at last, the people have a say. Every vote is finally equal. Every woman's vote, every man's vote. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make democracy fairer. <coughs> reform? <coughs> I'll tell you what real reform is. Abolition. We women know about systemic unfairness, regardless of our walk in life. As soon as we enter the workplace, we're forced to tolerate a number of inequalities. Every woman present in this room knows what I'm talking about. We hope our daughters may have to live with fewer than we've had to take on the chin. But the Shannon is one inequality we can eradicate right now with a simple tick in a box. 
Let's do it. Not just for our daughters, though, but for our sons, too, so that nobody's child grows up in a republic where one man or woman has a vote and another's voice is silenced.